we are on an everyday mission because God has commanded us as his followers to join the mission that he is on to see people redeemed, to see disciples made. And there are some key verses that I'm hoping will come up on the screen now. Um, it's in the drawer in uh, the office. Oh, that is why we have a technical difficulty. So the first passage that we're going to be looking at is actually at the end of Matthew. If you want to turn with me to Matthew 28, um, it talks about the Great Commission that God has given each one of us. Matthew 28. It's known as the Great Commission, and it says, And Jesus said to them, them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded, And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have been commanded by God to make disciples. This happened shortly after his resurrection. He shared with his disciples that you have the opportunity, as my disciples, to go and make more disciples, baptizing them into a brand new identity in Christ, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, And then he gives us a very awesome promise. And he says, And surely I am with you even to the end of the age. So as we go and make disciples, we're not going it alone. The power of the Holy Spirit is alive in us as we go and make disciples of all nations. And as this happens, it's God doing his mission through us his church, as we reach out to the people that God has called us to minister to. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, he says, And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this mission that God has called us to is indeed an everyday mission, And it takes place in our families, in our church, in our city, and in our world. And for the next four weeks, today we are going to be talking about family. Next week we are going to be talking about what does it look like to be on mission in our church and as a church. What does it look like, uh, in a few weeks we'll be talking about what does it look like to live on mission in the city that God has placed us in. And lastly, we're going to be talking about the world, the ends of the earth that God has called us to reach. Now, not every single one of us will be able to go to Africa on a foreign mission trip, but if we don't go, we should be sending. We should be resourcing and sending people out. So today, we are going to be talking about this redemptive mission that God has for each and every one of us. I don't know if our slides are going to work now. Oh, we're working on that. So some mornings, things don't go as planned. Has that ever happened to you? Where, where life, you wake up and you think, I've got this day. And then it just doesn't go as planned? Welcome to reality. Um, we're all there. So, the next passage that I'd like to look at, if you'd like to turn with me as well, uh, we can look at 2 Corinthians. Oh, you know what? Actually, wait, I skipped a passage. Uh, Psalm 128, verses 1 through 6. This is an amazing passage. Just like Acts 1.8 said that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Kind of these outgoing circles. This passage 
uh, talks about that as well. And I see that the whole passage isn't up there. So if we look at Psalm 120... Oh, there we go. A song of ascension. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Okay, so first of all, if we just look at verse 1, do all of us walk in the ways of the Lord perfectly? No. So I, I read this verse this past week, and I said, oh, no, I'm done. Um, I thought, you know, I can't even get through verse 1. It says, you know, because I want to be blessed. It says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of your labor and of your hands. You shall be blessed. It shall be, it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Even in this passage, in the Old Testament, in Psalm 128, it talks about the family, and then it talks about the blessing in Zion, which is the church, and then it talks about the blessing in Jerusalem, which is the city, and then it talks about the blessing um, of the gospel going out of the, of the nation of Israel. So it's these circles going out. And we know that families are certainly under attack today. Every family I know is going through great struggle, great uh, turmoil, great chaos. But we know that Healthy families produce healthy churches, and healthy churches produce healthy cities, and healthy cities produce a healthy nation. So the key is the gospel doing its work in our families. I have a friend who uh, was um, appointed as a youth pastor on the south side of Chicago, uh, only because he walked into an elder meeting and said, somebody should do something with these kids. And they said, thank you so much for volunteering. Um, and he said, well, I've only been a Christian a, sh a few short months. I used to be a gang member, and now I am a follower of Christ, and I want to see the kids in our neighborhood impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to see their families become healthy. I want to see this church become healthy. And these elders said, you know what, thank you once again for volunteering. We are so glad you're excited about this opportunity. He said, I don't know anything about youth ministry. And they said, that's okay, neither do we. <laughs> and, and he said, okay, well, I guess all I know about following Jesus is what I've learned at this church. And all we do is we read the Bible and we pray. And God does something. And he said, when I was, a, and this is a friend of mine, Harvey, Harvey said that when Jesus transformed my heart, he did that through the power of the word of God and through the power of prayer. And so Harvey said, all I know is I'm going to round up these kids and we're going to pray and we're going to study the word of God. And the first week he had five kids show up and he was so excited to see the impact that he was going to have on these five kids. But these five kids were hoping that there would be games and pizza and stuff like that. Um, and he said, I don't know anything about games. I don't know anything about pizza. I, I, don't know that that, I didn't know that's what I was supposed to do. He said, so we're going to study the Word of God and we're going to pray. And next, the next week, only two kids showed up uh, because three of them were kind of looking for a party. Those two kids stuck with him. And we need to remember that this church that he was at was a very small church, but it continued to grow as he was faithful to the word of God and faithful to prayer. 
over time, this church uh, that was about 100 people big um, began to see their youth group grow larger than the church. And over the course of the next two years, there were 2,000 kids uh, coming to youth group. Um, they outgrew the church that they were meeting in, so he met at another church, and the impact of the gospel went out. These families in this community were changed. This church was radically changed, and by the power of God, the community was radically changed because of Harvey's faithfulness to God and God's faithfulness through Harvey to see that community changed. This was a community that had problems with uh, drug addiction, uh, gang issues, uh, liquor stores were plentiful. After, three more, after a few more years, uh, there wasn't a liquor store open in their neighborhood. It, be, it began to radically shape the city that they were in. And now Harvey has gone out into the world and reached many people with that same gospel power of Jesus Christ. So we can look at, at the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ is that we realize the grace that God is extending to us. And when we realize that, we don't just hoard the grace that God has given us, but we extend it to those around us. So when we look at this passage, Psalm 128, we realize that healthy families that are radically transformed by the gospel are going to produce a church that is healthy and radically transformed by the gospel. And then a city, and then hopefully a whole nation, or even the uttermost parts of the world. And this isn't going to happen by our strength. This isn't going to happen by us doing it. We cannot change other people. Like I've said many other Sundays, I have tried to change other people and it does not work. I've, I'm still trying and it's still not working. I've even tried to change myself and I can't. It is by the grace of God that I continually am being transformed by his work. And in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It is God doing his work through us. Now, I have not been videotaping your families this past week, and it's probably good. Um, every family I know and every family represented by each one of us here, we're all going through struggles. If we are honest, there are struggles and grief and um, temptations and sin that are invading our homes and causing chaos. And we look at this ministry of reconciliation that God has invited us into, and quite often this ministry of reconciliation is the furthest thing from our mind. What is happening is we're walking through our everyday life. We encounter a struggle, and what is at the forefront of our mind is the struggle or the temptation or the sin or how our husband is doing everything wrong or how our wife just if she were a lot different than she is life would be a lot easier or if these crazy kids we have just weren't so crazy life would be manageable we could figure this out or if our extended family our in-laws or maybe you want to call them outlaws i don't know um it gets crazy chaotic to look at the reality that God has invited us to be 
his ambassadors to our families. And this is difficult. God has called us to make disciples of the nations. And when we look at that, we go, oh, you know what? I could prepare to be on a mission trip and go away, and I could see doing that. But the reality of making disciples in our own homes is a daunting task because we know each other. And we know that our spouse, what they deserve, is not grace. We, we, we convince ourselves of this reality. But the reality, according to the transforming work of Jesus Christ in our lives, is that what God is calling us to do is extend the grace that people need. He's calling us to, even though our spouse maybe doesn't deserve grace, we have the opportunity to extend grace. And this is a hard reality because we know each other well. The closer you are to someone, the more you see their sin, their struggle, their temptations, their warts. And you're like, you know what? They do not deserve the grace of God. But the reality is, neither do you. None of us deserve the grace of God. But God in His mercy and God in His love for us extended grace to us. Therefore, we get to extend grace to others. As we are making disciples, the core way that that happens as, is that we are gracing one another. We are gospeling one another. You come home, you're worn out, you're tired, you've had a long day at the office, and dinner is not ready. Awesome time to extend grace. That's not the first thing that came to your mind, right? Yeah. Maybe some few, a few choice words. But here's what happens is when we try to do things on our own strength, apart from the grace of God, we do use those few choice words. And then our spouse adds a few more bricks to the wall between us. And it severs relationship. It breaks us apart. But God in His grace allows us to see that and that's actually God's loving kindness allowing us to see our sin of not being full of grace. But God invites us to be overflowing with grace because we have received so much grace from him. That means we can extend that same grace to others. We have received so much undeserved love from God that we get to go and love those who are difficult to love. Jesus served us by dying on a cross. Therefore, we get to serve others by dying to ourselves. Now, this doesn't sound very popular or very easy, and it's not. I'm not here to give you an easy message that making disciples in your family, joining God's everyday mission in your family, I'm not, I'm not saying it is easy. I'm saying it will test every part of you it will bring you to the end of yourself. And when you are at the end of yourself, you'll see what you need is Jesus. And coming to the end of ourselves is actually a very, very blessed gift that God has given us. And there should have been one more slide, but... All right, thank you. So, if we look at this passage in Colossians, and I love the book of Colossians, it talks about the supremacy of Christ in all things. This passage, uh, Colossians 3, 18 through 21, says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So wives are called to submit to their husbands as is fitting to the Lord. 
what that means is we are supposed to, as wives, wives are supposed to submit to their husbands as Christ submitted to God the Father. And he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. He died that we might have life. Therefore, wives, you have an awesome opportunity to submit to the Lord and to submit to God's authority in your life to say, you know what, I'm going to come and I'm going to figure out how can I serve my husband. My husband does not deserve the grace that God has given him, but could I, as a wife, be the vessel that God is going to work through to bring about change in my husband? Wives, you can't change your husbands. But God can. And God can do his transforming work, not because of you, but through you. As you serve your husband, that is modeling Christ to your husband. And it is actually the kindness of the Lord that leads us to change. If we try to convince other people or bully other people or arm twist people, into change, they actually rebel more. We don't need to see more rebellion. What we need to see is a heart transformed by the grace of God. Husbands, it goes on to say, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I know a lot of guys that are harsh with their wives. That they just let words fly out. And this is a commandment to say, you know what, do not be harsh with your words. Do not be harsh towards your wife. But as Christ loved the church, that's how we are to love our wives. So husbands, we have an awesome opportunity to extend grace to our wives. And in that extending of grace, what God does is transforms hearts. And what we're looking for in this disciple-making everyday mission is not just changed behavior, but changed hearts. Because when our hearts are changed, that, that goes out and allows us to live differently. If we just are looking for behavior modification, um, a lot of us can kind of muster up the strength to be obedient until we get caught the next time. Um, we, can, we can muster up a good uh, image to make people believe that we are obeying what God has called us to. But if there's not heart transformation at its core, it's just a covering. And that will become undone. And God will reveal the true nature of our hearts. So that's why in disciple making, I'm looking for heart change, not just behavior change. But it does go on to say, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. The only way a child is going to obey a parent is by the grace of God. The only way that that is going to happen is if that child is being transformed by the powerful work of the grace of Jesus Christ. This past week, um, my wife volunteered at my son's youth group. And she worked with the young lady, so she didn't really hang out with my son very much, which was good, because she needs to give him a little space. But something very awesome happened. My wife is feeling kind of called to help disciple these young ladies at our home church. And my, my, my son said to my wife, you know what, if God is calling you to impact young ladies' lives through coming to youth group, I'm okay with you coming, through, coming to youth group. Um, that's evidence of a change in our son's heart because a week ago he said, you know what, no, I don't want you at my youth group, it's mine. <laughs> um, but the reality is when our hearts are softened by the grace of God, that allows disciple-making to happen. So we are on an everyday mission as disciples of Jesus Christ, and our everyday mission is to join God's redemptive mission to see broken people made whole, to see lost people found, to see people that feel unloved label themselves as a dearly loved child of God. 
in our families, it is the most difficult place to make, fa- make disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's going to continue to be a very difficult place. But it is also the most rewarding place to see disciples made. When you see the work of God transforming your family members right before your eyes, you actually have a front row seat to what God is doing. And God is on a mission, and God will faithfully carry out his disciple-making efforts in our lives by his grace. This isn't something we do, but we get to join him in it. We are his ambassadors as though Christ were doing his very work through us. And that is exactly what is happening as we join God's everyday mission. Next week, we're going to be talking about what does it look like to be on an everyday mission as a church? And we desperately need to be gracing one another. Every one of us walked through those doors this morning, and we all need the grace of God more than we know. And God has given us this church to be an encouragement, to be a blessing, to spur one another on, to speak truth in love to one another. Then we're going to talk about reaching our cities. I know in this church there are many cities represented. There's Sturgeon Bay, there's Algoma, there's Kiwani, and a few others. I want to talk about what would it look like if we made disciples in our everyday life, on this everyday mission, in the communities we live in and in the workplaces we work in. And lastly, there is a great big world out there, and there's a lot of people that don't yet know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And my hope and prayer is that Lakeside would be a church that would some people would be going to the ends of the earth, and some people would be sending. You're, either, you're, you're one, apart, one of either of those two groups. You're either going or you're sending. That's just the way it works as disciples of Jesus Christ. Now I know some of you in this room may not know Christ yet as your Savior and Lord. And my hope and prayer is that today would be the day that you realize that God in his love is reaching out to you. He's offering you the grace that you don't deserve. He died on a cross so that you might have life in him. It's not a life that you earned on your own merit. It's a life that he grants to you. And if you have questions about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I would love nothing more than to talk with you after the service. I'll just be right in the back. So feel free to pull me aside, and I would love to talk with you about what what does that look like to follow Jesus? What does it look like for him to save you by his grace? and become a child of God. So let's pray this morning um, that God would continue his grace-filled work in and through us. Oh Lord, we thank you uh, that even though we aren't perfect and Lord, we struggle, Lord, your grace is sufficient. Lord, you meet us with your powerful grace right at our greatest need. Lord, I pray that this morning we would come to the end of ourselves realizing that we cannot do it apart from you. We cannot live life. We cannot breathe our next breath. Lord, we cannot make disciples apart from you. If if anything, uh, we'd end up just making duplicates of ourselves. But Lord, what we want to do is make disciples and followers of you. So Lord, by your grace, continue your work in us and through us. Lord, I thank you that you have, by your wisdom, placed us in the families you have placed us in. Lord, there is absolutely no mistake that you have placed us right where you would have us. And Lord, you have placed us in the families that you have placed us in to be your ambassadors and make disciples of those that are closest to us. Lord, I pray for the marriages represented in this room. I pray that you would continue your redeeming work. Lord, if there's marriages that are on the brink of divorce or on the brink of separation, Lord, bring health and wholeness. Lord, if there are uh, husbands and wives that 
um, are, are unequally yoked. They don't uh, maybe share the same faith. Lord, I pray that you would unite them under your grace-filled power. Lord, I pray uh, for parents as we raise children. Lord, by your grace, allow us to raise them under an atmosphere of grace and truth. And Lord, I pray as we extend um, your grace to our extended family, Lord, help us realize uh, that when we see sin or when we see chaos or when we see struggle, Lord, help us see that as not um, a problem, but Lord, help us see that as an opportunity to extend your grace-filled gospel to those that desperately need it. Lord, help us not be a people that judge others for their sin, but Lord, help us be a people that come alongside and allow you to minister to them through us. Lord, I thank you so much for the power of your word, and Lord, I pray right now that you would continue in, in us, uh, that you'd continue your work in us as we worship you the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.